I'm glad to introduce Dr. Jerry Davison, who is here to tell us about his career path for SSCP's How Did I Get Here video series. Dr. Davison received his BA in Social Relations from Harvard and his PhD in Clinical Psychology from Stanford University. His graduate advisor was Albert Bandura. Dr. Davison is currently Professor of Psychology and Gerontology at the University of Southern California. He joined SSCP when it was first established in 1966 by Len Krasner and Peter Lang. Dr. Davison, please describe your career path and tell us about any obstacles or barriers that you overcame along the way. In addition, tell us what has surprised you about your job and what you wish you had known earlier about this type of position. Okay, well, thank you, Sarah. And it's, uh, it's a great privilege to be able to talk to the membership this way. Um, things started, you know, as an undergraduate, pretty much. I was curious about human behavior and I kind of found psychology accidentally by reading Freud's uh, lectures at Clark around 1917 as I was going to a summer job where I was working graveyard shift. Then I stumbled into the introductory course in the department called Social Relations at Harvard, uh, which was an amalgam of psychology and sociology and linguistics uh, pr primarily. Um, one thing or another led me to uh, work with Jerome Bruner, um, very well-known cognitive psychologist, and I ended up doing an honors thesis with him on the uh, effects of set on perception. And this was a, actually turns out to have been a theme that has carried through my entire career. How do people's uh, predilections or biases affect what they see, how they feel? I think you can sort of see a, a connection with cognitive behavior therapy, which is the branch of clinical psych that I'm, I'm most um, identified with. I'm glancing down here for the viewers at notes I have on my computer here, so uh, forgive me for that. After college, I was uncertain really what I wanted to do, so I ended up uh, taking a Fulbright to Germany, where I studied philosophy and psychology. I studied such things as handwriting analysis and Rorschach. I don't talk about this too much, but I did. I uh, did it all in German, which was pretty cool. And, uh, and decided um, during that year that instead of going to law school, as I had thought I might do after college, I decided to go to Stanford. I had an acceptance from them, which they kindly deferred for a year, and I went to Stanford in the fall of 62. I went to study social psych with Fessinger. He had moved on to something else. I fell in with Tony Deutsch and brain stimulation research he was doing. Uh, and then I was having dinners with colleagues of mine, other first-year students, and they were talking about some guy named Bandura who was applying and talking about and writing and doing research and applying experimental psychology to clinical problems. Now, believe it or not, from our current perspective, this is hardly a radical idea. But at this time, which was uh, literally the fall of 62, it was a fairly new idea to most people, not to everyone, of course, but to most people, and it was an idea that had never been broached to me uh, in my undergraduate days, as, as, as uh, wonderful that experience was to be an undergraduate at Harvard. So I'd, I went to Bandura and I asked about switching into clinical. That time was easy to switch into clinical. I did, um, and uh, I studied um, uh, behavior therapy with him, assessment with Walter Michelle, and then Arnold Lazarus came to visit for a year at, uh, at Stanford, which was a transforming experience for me, I sat in with him a lot. I learned about that theory practice gap. Um, read at that time, one could read everything in the literature on behavior therapy, and I've kept up with the field that way. And then went to Stony Brook, uh, and which was a, uh, a brave new world of behavior therapy. Uh, it was a clinical program set up by um, Len Krasner and Harry Kalish, and I had known Len when he was at the VA in Palo Alto where I, I interned, and so I decided instead of going to um, Wisconsin, uh, where I had an option to go, I went to Stony Brook. And um, one of the reasons I went, I think it's relevant to my career path, is that Stony Brook took really seriously the role of clinical teaching and clinical supervision. And it did this, in my view, by walking the walk, not just talking the talk. That is, it gave clinical, it gave clinical supervision formal teaching credit. Now, that may seem like kind of boring administrative uh, ploy, but it really isn't. It went to the heart of what Stony Brook was all about. And it really was the vision of uh, Kalish and Krasner that 
uh, they deserve eternal credit for in setting up this kind of program and uh, taking this route into a, at the time, fairly narrow uh, view of what behavior therapy was. Uh, the other two things that I'll, I'll say about my years at Stony Brook before I came to USC in, in um, 79 were two books that I, I wrote while I was there. The one was Abnormal Psychology with, with John Neal, um, passed away a couple of years ago, uh, unfortunately. John and I had a wonderful collaboration. We collaborated on nine editions together of the book. I'm happy to say it really kind of had an effect on how clinical psychology or abnormal psychology was um, conceptualized for students, how it was taught. Uh, other books um, came along as well. Um, it's now uh, handled by a couple of other wonderful people, um, uh, Ann Kring and Sherry Johnson. And the other book I want to mention is my book with Marv Goldfried called Clinical Behavior Therapy that we published in 1976. I'm happy to say it's, it's regarded as a citation classic. It's been um, cited quite a bit. And the purpose of that book was to, was to make, uh, take advantage of our experience in doing clinical supervision in, in showing what it's really like, as best one can with the printed word, what it's, it's really like to sort of do behavior therapy. And the behavior therapy that we were doing at that time was what we now call cognitive behavior therapy or an early version thereof. So that's sort of, I moved to USC to spin a little stale at Stony Brook. I loved it there. It was sad to leave. I've been very happy here uh, at USC and participating in various efforts here. I've been doing a lot of different things in administration and in my research, but my home, I'm back home within the clinical psych program in psychology at USC. I'm very happy to be here. Uh, the next question you talked about was the biggest obstacle. And <clears throat> I had a few interesting to reflect on these when you're asked to. One of my biggest obstacles in teaching was I tried to cram too much into my lectures and into my courses. So the first undergraduate course I taught was an abnormal. This is a course, by the way, which helped me ultimately to work on a book with John Neal in the field. But I tried to, uh, I felt there was a lot to learn and I put too much, uh, I put too much of a burden on the students. And that's, that was an obstacle. I didn't have a, a lot of mentoring or advice on the teaching part, uh, which is an, always an issue in research intensive universities. Uh, but I found my way, I think. The next thing is, um, I don't wish to offend colleagues and friends and students, or whatever, but I found that one of the things I learned as an undergraduate, and especially in this sort of interdisciplinary department that I majored in, was uh, the larger context of psychology. You might call it where, where it's nested within the liberal arts. Um, I, I, that's where I live and breathe, always have. Um, and I don't find that those broad interests are as well represented. Uh, among colleagues and students, uh, many, most of them, that I've encountered over the years. And it comes down to how one evaluates applications for graduate school. And my own bias is to look for students with a solid liberal arts background. And yes, of course, a specialization in psychology, um, usually a major in psychology, but not necessarily. But I'm really interested in people who think broadly about the human condition. Uh, and I think that's something which psychology, clinical psych in particular, needs uh, very much. Uh, another obstacle, and I think the third one in my little list here, is um, the, the position paper that I gave as a presidential address in 1974 as outgoing president of what was then the Association for Advancement in Behavior Therapy. Now it's renamed Association for Behavioral and Cognitive Therapies, which is a, a great renaming of an organization. And as some of the viewers might know, I argued in that address of mine that, that the therapy process and the assessment process are impossible to think about without embedding them uh, in, in a world of values and biases and prejudices of uh, human be those human beings who call clinicians, as well as society at large. And I found myself, much to my surprise, I must say, coming to the conclusion that we should stop offering change of orientation programs uh, because it was... Um, uh, it was not consistent with the politics and values that I felt were proper uh, to to pursue. And that inherently, as Seymour Halleck um, uh, wrote in his Politics of Therapy book, a wonderful book that he published, I, I think in the uh, late 60s, early 70s, that we don't operate in a value-free or, po or pol political politics-free environment. 
and we should make this explicit. Um, the, the obstacle I felt was that I had trouble making the argument, making it understood to, uh, for people, but I persisted. And over the years, as we all know, um, the field has, as both the mental health field and society at large is taking a more positive view towards that pattern of behavior and affect and feelings that we call homosexuality. Uh, whether you see it on a Kinseyan continuum or not is, is less uh, important than the attitudes and practices that we have as a society. So I, I call it an obstacle. At the same time, it was really something that I was uh, the most um, happy about. I guess I have one other point on their obstacles, and that is the, the life of the academic. Um, I went into, you know, this phrase ivory tower or ivy colored, ivy tower, ivory tower. Uh, it doesn't exist. <laughs> I mean, if anyone out there knows a place, of course, I'm too old to make the move now, but I've, I've not found it. And um, academics more and more has become a business. Uh, it's corporate. Uh, I mean, it has to make money, even though they're nonprofit for the most part. But um, academics uh, is, is people say, well, that's academic, meaning it's not relevant. No, it's, it's a misuse of a term. Or the real world, those of us who live in academia, I think can assure people this is part of the real world as well. And the, and the other part of it is that being a clinician is a tough job. And it's fraught with, with um, um, dangers and risks and a great deal of responsibility that, frankly, as a, as a training clinician in graduate school and on my internship, I was only vaguely aware of. Uh, someone once asked me, gee, would you have gone into clinical psych if you knew how challenging it would be emotionally, intellectually, and in terms of one's own values? And the most honest answer I have is I don't know. I think I would because the intellectual challenges in clinical psych are very rich. And um, I find, I mean, to me, it's a privilege to be within this part of the field we call psychology. Um, Going on to the next question, I'm check, checking here. What do I wish I'd known in graduate school about this type of job? Um, really good question. And one thing I, I could have used more education or warning about is related to some, you know, some stuff I've already said, is that there's, there's a lot of politics, professional, personal. A lot of it's quite petty in academia, but it's everywhere. I don't think academia is any worse. It's just not different. It's not... Um, clean, if you will. It's, it's, it's inevitable. When people get together and work in organizations of one kind or another, their biases play a role. Their, uh, their egos play a role. Their insecurities and arrogance play a role. And I think if I'd been forewarned about that, <clears throat> I still would have gone into the field, but I would have, I think, gone in more, more with my eyes open. Um, I've held a lot of administrative positions over the years. I've been an academic dean actually for three schools here at USC. I've been department chair here for a dozen years and director of clinical training for a number of years, both at Stony Brook and here. And um, maybe it's because of these administrative involvements that I've become really acutely aware of these professional and personal conflicts because they get played out a lot. Uh, in, in, in what we call administrative settings. Of course, they get played out a lot in the world of science as well, in, in, in grant getting, in the politics of review panels and so forth. Again, it's, it's part of the, the human condition. But um, I've learned about this. I try to tell my students about it, not to discourage them from going into academia at all. I think it's a great life. It's really a privilege. But um, it's not, um, as I said earlier, it's not the ivory ivory tower. Um, and uh, I think the last thing that I, I may have to say is um, trying to sort of tie it all together is that I went into the field because I went as intensely curious about my own psychological uh, stuff as most of us are. I was curious about other people. I've always been kind of voyeuristic from a psychology point of view. That's what I think led me to um, read Freud's uh, introductory lectures between my freshman and sophomore year at Harvard when I was uh, on the graveyard shift from my home in Dorchester to uh, the, uh, near the entrance of the Sumner Tunnel where the Colonial Provision Factory was, and I was on an uh, assembly line packing hams, interestingly enough. I was making kosher hams, people joke about. But uh, it wasn't by accident that I picked up 
uh, Freud's lectures, and they were captivating, they were intriguing, they were, they made me very puzzled, they were outrageous. I kept asking myself, how do you know, how do you know? And that got me into the epistemology of things, which has always been a concern and interest of mine. But I was ready for this, and then I was ready to go to an introductory lecture I had not planned to go on and into in, in social relations and ended up graduating in, in the field in social relations, turning away from a career in law, which one wonders what would life have been like, um, and ending up at Stanford, ending up in clinical, and ending up uh, in uh, a card-carrying member of SSCP as well as ABCT, and that says uh, a great deal about uh, my life course. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Davison.